As you know, the indulgences for the Holy Souls have been made more available because of the pandemic through extending what would have been for the octave of all souls to the end of November. And so I've been going backwards and forwards quite a bit to the graves just behind us. And each time, especially if one goes there when it's dark, just before the end of day, one pauses, one thinks, one hears, one ponders, one asks questions. Some Irish poet did that years ago and wrote a poem which was basically two lines sitting in a graveyard. Lonely, 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 lonely. A story with a middle only. I happened to pause by one fairly recent grave last night and there was a quote from Oscar Wilde who, as you probably know, did become a Catholic just before he died. He had thought of it for a long time, but it was kept on a long finger. But grace was given to him, and I'm glad it was, because he enriched our literature with little gems that will always live on. They're just neutral words that he has, talking about the way that he's going to be lying beneath the long grass, and to forget time even says to forgive life, a way of putting things. He went on, but his voice is still heard. Many go, and they will not be heard. But they are, and there is a huge noise in the silent grave. If we were to open the lid of each one, what would we hear? It is only a punctuation mark, not a full stop, that moment of death which is actually quite often on the grave itself, in the date. And on it goes. All eternity hangs on that last bit. Was the soul ready? The Gospel of today. And today, should the Lord knock, would we be ready? Advent is working on several levels, and it comes through, right through the liturgy. We're waiting for the immediate, because we don't crash into a big event. Imagine if the Queen of England were coming to your house, you would prepare. So it is that the King of Kings has preparation from the beginning of church time, Advent, the coming, and it works well, because we reread prophets, the waiting centuries. And for now, they didn't have the fullness until the Incarnation. It was progressive. The Lord was teaching them bit by bit. And when we have things like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, there they were partial. It was to stop everyone doing the maximum each time. But in the Lord we have the fullness, what it means actually. And so it is that we have not less, but more, than Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and all the awaiting centuries until the Incarnation. As it happens, when a student, I was spending years really looking into what thought was before the Incarnation. Because in Latin and Greek you're handling people who don't yet have that fullness. And yet they get there with some truths already. Philosophy is interesting because they are lovers of wisdom. And they try to find what they can. And they often get to some prime mover. We know that Thomas Aquinas used the thought of Aristotle and Christianized it. Why? All truth is his truth, and we never have to be afraid of any truth. Remember that in conversation. If you are getting noisy and nervous, it means you're afraid of more truth. And so one listens. 
and takes what one can, and calmly in answer adds another bit of truth. And if then there's a problem, the problem is not in the truth. It's the noisy person who himself doesn't want to face it. Remember that before using your temper. But the other level is the end of time and of life. We priests who have a lot to do with that know full well how it cannot be escaped. I may have told you before, but I'll tell you again because it's true. It's what happened to a good holy priest in London. Still alive, I believe, is Father Patrick of the Brompton Oratory. He is a lover of souls and will not let a single go soul go through his fingers. He goes to hospital beds and he talks to them about the real thing and not about the weather or the football. And he was coming to this man who was really close to death. There was not much they could do. And so he was on death row and he could see that the words R.C. were on his file. So it was his right to do what he could. And of course he was pushed away. He was one of those who had been way away from any kind of church life for many years. And the heart was hardened. And that was coming through. But he wouldn't go away, even though the man was pushing him away. Giving him to understand it was no use at all insisting in his case. He left the church years previously but he wouldn't go away. And the man got a little irritated, indicating that the priest was wasting his time. He wouldn't go away. He stood there and looked straight into his eyes. And the man got a bit nervous. What are you looking at? And the good priest calmly said as he looked into his eyes, I've never looked into the eyes of a man who's going to hell before. And with that, he started to turn and go towards the door of the ward. Just as he got to the door, he heard a faint, oh, come back to that one. And he was able, because he'd insisted, to get that soul back for all eternity. That's the value of one soul. All the time, Souls are leaving this planet, and how many are prepared? The rhythm is actually colossal. Since we've had this celebration now, this morning, if you can calculate it, you can have some idea. You have to multiply the seconds by two. That gives you some idea already of the souls that have gone before us in that time since we started Holy Mass this morning. How many are prepared? You know that at Auschwitz, when they got there, the first thing that they did was to put them there in a line and somebody with responsibility would say this way or that way. That meant that with one look they could see if they could work or not and if they couldn't they went straight to the gas chambers. So, what is this procession of souls from the earth all the time, this way or that way? this way or that way, and all could have been prepared if we took seriously the gift of time. One moment can win all eternity, or indeed lose it forever.